Okay. Um, hello for the few of you that have joined. Hopefully, we will join shortly. Um, thank you for signing up for today's program, College in the Time of COVID-19. Um, this is a bit of a follow-up program to one that we did in the spring, uh, kind of talking about, you know, all, with all the uncertainties that's going on with college these days um, and, and life in general. Uh, we brought in some specialists from uh, Spotlight College Advising to kind of uh, tell us what's going on and, you know, what we can expect. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll turn it over to those specialists, Kim Anderson and Kendall Hayes from Spotlight College Advising. Thanks, Nicole. Um, since we have sort of a small group, Nicole, uh, um, I, for those of you, we just for the format of today, there's going to be a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to submit questions, we're going to do the presentation. And then at the end, we will cover, you know, we'll have time for question and answer. So if you'd like to type in, but in the beginning, I was wondering, since it's a smaller group, if you want to type in what, you know, just 10, 11, 12, college, like what age your kids are. And that way, when we're talking about some of these things, we can expand on the things that might be more relevant to your age. So if you want to just put that in the Q&A or the chat box and shoot that, I can't see uh, those, but Kendall and Nicole, if you, those pop up, yeah. that would be great. All right, so we are obviously as living in sort of unprecedented times right now. And I've heard that word more than I care to in the last four or five months. But I think that from our perspective, the, the reason that we really appreciate Nicole and LaGrange Library partnering with us on this event is that it is a really important time to help you as you know parents of probably high school students, there might be a few college parents as well, but understand really how to navigate what's to come. And you know, over the course, part of our job every day is to read, you know, various news outlets, blogs, listservs you subscribe to. And is what you find is the things have really evolved. So when we first did this presentation, Kendall was back, back May 20th or something like that. It was when the kind of the early days of the pandemic. Um, if you went back and reflected on some of the things we talked about that day, a lot has sort of shifted as the um, illness or the pandemic has progressed. So tonight's um, information is meant to be, you know, good and appropriate for the students that are going to be applying this fall. But please recognize that things that we say could change tomorrow. Um, as I was going back and kind of just reflecting on some of the things from our last presentation, I just, you know, so much has changed. So I guess I just want to say that um, as we start. So right now is just a little bit of an overview, sort of for us, things obviously are changing every day. We talked about that. The biggest thing that has occurred, and it's a positive thing to some extent, uh, is that a large number of the colleges and universities have gone test optional. And that's been driven to a large degree by the inability for people to attend ACT and SAT, which are the two standardized, main two standardized tests. Those testing centers were closed during the pandemic, during the heat of it. And now there's a huge backlog that people are, they're trying to really catch up on. So a lot of these students that are the rising seniors that are the class of 2021, do not have the test scores that they would like to have. So a large number of the colleges and universities were probably around, I would think 75% at this point, have gone test optional. So what that means is that if you have a test score, an ACT or SAT score, you can submit it with your application. But if you do not have a score, you will not be penalized. And each school is sort of going to view the application um, in, a, they're looking at them in different ways. So there's probably about a third, a third of the schools that were test optional and have been, and that trend has been going, growing, I guess, over the last probably five years. But these schools that are going test optional because of COVID are sort of forced under duress to come up with a model to evaluate the students this fall 
and they aren't all sure in the you know different presentations and admissions reps that we've listened to over the course of the last couple of months how they're going to do it so i guess i'm saying that now and we can talk about that more at the question and answer but just know that um, it's going to be a unique environment for the admission season and test optional is one concept and test blind is another so test blind means that even if you have a test, they would never consider it or look at it. So test optional, they would look at it and consider it. So we just say, if you have a strong test score, submit it, even if it's a test optional school, because it can only benefit your application. So that is um, important to know. And if you don't have a strong test score, don't put it as a test optional school. Do not feel as though you have to submit it. I think um, one, one add, Kim, too, is um, that it's important to note that colleges that are, are going test optional for this admission season very, very well may revert back and Good not point. be test optional next year. So for this year's current seniors, they may have a test optional option. Um, next year's seniors, so this year's rising juniors and juniors, um, that same school may not be test optional next fall when they're submitting their application. So just something to, to note and be aware of. Thank you for saying that. And sure. I will say when you're investigating schools, a number of them seem to be saying they're gonna you know, test it this year and potentially continue. And the very few though, I think you know, I've seen a handful say that they've committed to do it for two or three years. But yes, great point, Kendall, thank you. Sure. Um, all right, so then also, some are kind of adjusting their deadlines. Initially, May 1st is was decision day. So this past May, the class of 2020 made their decision. And then usually there's some shuffling the months that follow as you know spots become available off of wait lists and things like that. So th we are not quite sure what's going to happen. I, most of the schools are saying that for the class of 2021, they are going to stick with their application deadlines. So for most people, there's um, different types of ways to apply to college. There's early decision, early action. Those deadlines are typically in early November. Uh, regular decision deadlines are typically in January. So some of the schools that um, have offered early decision in the past are removing that, others are adding it. So just know that any information that you get on your on schools that you're anticipating applying to, if you're a rising junior or senior, you may just wanna to go to the website and the admissions section of the website and always just get the most current information. Uh, all right, so one of the things that are, so we have a lot of clients that we work with on a daily basis. So one of the big questions that comes up for those students is what can they do to be able to research the schools when they're closed? So I will say that one of the huge silver linings of the COVID crisis is that all of the schools have really stepped up and delivered some amazing virtual tours and virtual um, opportunities and some to connect with students through Zoom, some information sessions through Zoom. So if it is a campus that is on your list, whether it be a wide list or a short list, get on there, sign up for their virtual tour. You can do that by being added to their mail list, mailing list often. And then you will be able to see, all of them have been fairly um, good about listing different opportunities on their website. So I just encourage you, since you can't visit, use the virtual tour. There are opportunities to look at um, different interviews, things that uh, you know current students um, have posted online. Do anything you can. If you have a specific area that you're interested in, you can try and reach out to the admissions team and talk to someone about connecting with a professor. I will say that another positive of this is the admission reps and the teach the professors. Um, are available now, right? They're, the admissions teams are typically traveling a lot more and they you know, are answering emails and calls on the fly where right now they're hunkered down on, you know, at home, sort of there for you and your questions. So the best way for you to do your research when you can't get to campus is to connect. The last point is that the, uh, typically in the fall, the admissions reps from schools throughout the US will visit your high school. And it's a variety. Um, not every school obviously visits each high school, but usually there would be a schedule where 
rising seniors and rising juniors would be invited to meet with those admissions reps. The protocol and what each high school is going to do is probably going to be very different, but from the reps that we've talked to, they are not traveling at all for this fall season. They will be doing Zoom and virtual connections with the high schools. And the good news is that I think it'll allow them to actually see and meet you know, with more high schools. The bad news is, as you know, it's harder to connect with somebody over Zoom than it is in person. So you really um, wanna make sure that you participate in those Zoom sessions and ask questions, come prepared, having done some research about the universities, just so you have the opportunity to um, you know, gain information for your applications. I'm sorry. And then the last point is just, you know, this is for the current and sort of rising freshman class for college. Just, there has been just a huge shift in terms of what the colleges are doing, right? They're, the, the COVID crisis continues to kind of rage in different parts of the country. So each college is doing things a little bit differently. And um, there's a Chronicles for Higher Education that we follow has a list, uh, they surveyed 1,200 colleges, and this is kind of an ongoing database that they work with. Right now, 48% of the schools are going in person, 35% are going to operate on a hybrid model, which means a mix of in-person classes and online classes. 14% are 100% online. So those um, percentages are likely going to change and shift as it comes to actually starting. I know a few of the schools, like Notre Dame is one that is scheduled to start in, I think, three weeks. So I think that a lot of the universities are watching and going to be modifying their approach based on sort of the early days. But from everything that we've heard that, as Kendall mentioned earlier, that the testing is being modified only for the class of 2021. And from what we've heard, most schools are not adjusting fall tuition in any way. So you might be able to save room and board for the fresh rising freshmen if you are going to do all online classes and stay home, but otherwise you're going to be paying the full boat for the most part. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, okay. Okay. Sorry, we have a huge delay, a little Zoom delay here. Okay. All right, so we talked about making connections with admissions reps. Um, I gave some examples of how to do that, I think already in the previous slide. But the other, uh, I guess, thing that I would like to say is know that the admissions reps are often on a regional basis. So as you are making your connections, you can find out who handles the territory for where you, so you know, who handles Chicago for that particular university. That's really the rep that's going to likely be the first read on your application. And they are going to, in many cases, have some say um, y yes or no in terms of are they going to take you to the committee for review or, you know, each school sort of evaluates things a little bit differently, but just make the connection. Um, the next thing is we talk to students about kind of making sure that you're really looking at schools that are a good fit for you. So in the past, I think that students were casting their net a little further and wider across the US. We have seen that with the COVID, um, more students are sticking a little closer to home, particularly for the rising freshmen. And I was even working with one of my seniors yesterday, rising seniors, and he's taking some schools off of his list that were on his list before that were a little further than he would like to travel, just not knowing where things are going to be, you know, this a year from now when he's going to be going to school. So keep that in mind. So typically for us, the fit factors, it's like a three-legged stool. We have academic fit, financial fit, and social fit. So you want to make sure, obviously, the programs that you're interested in studying are offered at that university. If you can get a direct admit option to the school, that's fantastic. Sometimes you might come in as um, an engineering, you would come in as a general engineering student and then make decisions later about what special, specialized version of engineering you're, you're going to actually pursue. But um, you wanna make sure that they offer the programs you're looking for. I, I talked to a student, she wasn't one of my students, but she started at Skidmore College, which is on the East Coast. 
And she always knew that she wanted to do um, computer science and she didn't do a good job of exploring. And as it turned out, when she got to sophomore year, they didn't really have the programs that she was looking for. So as you're doing your school research, look at the academic fit. You wanna make sure you're fitting in terms of your, the rigor of classes and curriculum, but you also wanna make sure that they offer the majors that you're interested in pursuing. Um, financial fit is obvious. Some schools are, you know, there's all different price points for schools. Some schools are more generous than others. And when it comes to um, financial aid and merit scholarship opportunities, so you want to do all that exploration and research and don't apply to schools that aren't within your budget because inevitably, if you get accepted, you're going to be heartbroken if you can't go. So, and it's a lot of work to apply to each additional school. And then the final thing is just social fit. I touched on it a few minutes ago, like how far away, how big is the school that you want to go to? How far is it? Do you want to have a Greek life? Do you want to make sure they have a certain sport, club sports? Do you love big football? Is, is that an important element? So kind of looking at all those factors. I, the you know Common I, App, which is the main, ad. oh, sorry, go ahead. Can I do a quick add on fine for seniors, current, current seniors that are, are applying? I think one, um, one last thing that's so important to think about when you're finalizing your college list is if you're looking at your list and you see a couple of colleges on there that even if you are accepted, you know you will have absolutely no intention of going to, do, do not apply to that college. I'm always amazed at how many of my clients are applying to colleges that regardless of the admission decision made, if they were accepted, they really have no intention of going there. Um, so just make sure that that's kind of on your checklist too. Like, is this a college I would go to if I was accepted and, and why, right? You have to have right. answers to those before you just start randomly throwing applications out, out into the universe. So, right. sorry. Thanks. Great point. Oh no, that's great. And jump in, please. Okay. Um, that's a great point. And a lot of our, I would say the on average, our students will apply to eight to 10, 12 schools, mm -hmm. but don't feel like if you have a very specific program you're interested in, to Kendall's point, don't feel like you have to apply to 12 schools just because your friends are applying to 12 schools. Yeah. Um, so common application is the main platform, probably about 65 or 70% of the schools participate. That allows you to apply to up to 10 schools at one time. You put in all of your information. There is a, a personal statement that's like a 650 word essay with some prompts that you respond to as part of that. And that platform, you can start putting in information as soon as I think April, but it technically opens in a few days, August 1st, and anything you input prior to August 1st will convert and roll over. So just know that the Common App is very precise in terms of how it wants you to input information. It has very particular and specific character limits. So it's about trying to kind of maximize who you are in those limited characters. And they're gonna be looking at hours that you spent in terms of some of your service work and volunteering and um, other activities at school. So take a look if you haven't already, if you're a rising senior and you haven't already set up your account, we highly encourage you to do that. And also um, it allows you, then you'll be able to sort of take a look at all of the different essay requirements and supplemental essays that each school will have. And that's another way to sure get you to reduce your list to Kendall's point. A lot of the schools, so if you have 12 schools and they're on the more selective nature, you could have as many as you know, 20, 25 supplemental essays that go with that. Why this school, why this major, and, and on and on. So just, be prepared, but know that the Common App actually opens. So finalizing testing options. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about testing later, kind of toward the end of the presentation. But I just wanted to say here, um, recognizing that the schools are test optional, like we talked about earlier, know that there are still fall testing dates that will be happening for the rising seniors. If you have September or October ACT or SAT tests, those scores likely will be available um, early October scores would be the latest but for the early decision time frame in no, early November uh, but um, all of September and October scores would be available by your time you're applying for regular decision in January so 
it's important if you are able to get in and you feel safe. I know some students don't feel safe going to a testing center. Um, so if you're able to get in and from a health perspective, you can participate and you want to get an additional test, I think it can only benefit you. Uh, all right, so I touched on assay work just briefly, but uh, because, as I mentioned, so many of the schools are going test optional this year, all of these schools that in the past have had matrices of a GPA of this and a ACT or SAT of that is going to equate to, you know, this much merit scholarship money and it's going to equate to acceptance. So this year for those schools, it's going to be really challenging and the essays are going to become critical in terms of helping them understand who you are as a student. And I would encourage you to not be redundant with things that are already given in your activities list or additional information section. This, um, the Common App essay, the one that I mentioned is a 650 word essay, is their only chance to really get to know who you are outside of what your resume looks like. So take it seriously and know that all the supplemental essays that each school puts out there, they have a purpose and a reason for the question. And don't just wing it if it's a school that you're really interested in getting into. Anything else on that, Kendall? You want to think about it? Nope, not at all. Perfect. Okay, so the other million dollar question for the rising seniors, our class of 2021, is what is going to happen if a lot of the class of 2020 defers because they don't want to do online learning. And the reality is that, although we've heard a lot of buzz about this, most of the admission reps that we have, you know, talked to, that we've heard speak, have said that their deferral requests and their gap year requests, you can sometimes hear it called that, are not up significantly. There's some gloom and doom articles, I read one yesterday, that said typically, you know, gap year requests are at 3%. And we're projecting 12%, but this article was written back in May. So this person has no idea. So just if you're interested in a school, what I think would be a good suggestion is comparing the size of their freshman class for the class of 2019 to 2020, talking to someone, finding out if there have been spaces allocated for deferrals. Most of the schools did say that they would have a hard cap if they felt like they were getting out of control in terms of the requests, but they had not been experiencing in, in, in any excessive level of requests at the, you know, for most of the schools we talked to. Uh, and then finally, it's just kind of talking about the uh, school's financial viability. So this is obviously financially been a really difficult time for most of these universities. Um, yeah, it's just looking at an article today, University of Michigan is projected that 400 million to $1 billion loss on the, across their three campuses as a result of COVID. Um, the California system from March alone, the University of California system lost $558 million. So, when you're looking at schools, uh, you want to make sure that you understand what their financial stability is. You want to look at, I, we have a website on here that you can check out. We also want to, you can look at the size of particular schools endowment. Uh, in Michigan's case, you know, they have a billion dollar endowment, but think about that. If you're, they obviously can't tap into their endowment for all of these COVID issues, but you want to make sure their endowment's going to be able to cover a percentage of it, even if they're borrowing against it. So the schools that were already on shaky ground in 2019 are ones that you really need to be concerned about. So I encourage you as you're, you know, finalizing your list, particularly for the rising seniors, a lot of this information is hard to get on a current basis. Um, there's some databases that we rely on and they're usually on a one year leg. So any information and questions that you can ask at the, school level at your admissions um, office visits or information sessions would be really beneficial for your family just to make sure that the school is on solid financial ground. All right, Kendall, I think I'm going to throw it to you. Fantastic.
and it's going to be slow to come up. That's okay. That's okay. Welcome everyone. It's good to, it's, I'm excited. I'm excited to be able to visit with you guys tonight. Um, I want to, I want to speak specifically to my juniors, my juniors that are out there, our class of 2022 and things that um, I want to be on your radar uh, at this point in time, your focus uh, should be on academics. Um, this is the final year. Um, of grades that admission representatives are going to see before they make an admission decision on uh, on you, on your junior. So junior year is critical. And this is a really bizarre time because some high schools are, are obviously doing a hybrid model. Some high schools are going back in person full-time five days a week. Some high schools are, are going all e-learning or um, certainly families may have the option to, to be uh, completely virtual for their um, e-learning, at least for the first semester. Semester. So my word of advice to you is whatever option you choose, whatever option is available to you, you have to make the most of it. Whether you're in person, online, a hybrid of the two, these grades are absolutely critical. Your junior year grades are super important. Um, this is, you know, these, these grades are even more critical if, if you maybe started out on the slow side. Maybe your freshman year wasn't um, especially strong. You, you know, you, uh, it was a, a tough transition from middle school to high school. Um, maybe, hopefully, your sophomore year, you gained a little bit of speed. Um, if you started out slow, uh, your junior year is gonna be pretty pivotal, so you want to end on a high note all everyone loves the the comeback kid right so <laughs> that's going to be a really um, good story if you have kind of this upward grade trend and you can really prove yourself your junior year that you're you're ready and capable of, of college uh you know college level uh you know performance in in that you're ready for college i should say so um my next focus or my next point of, of interest to you is that your focus should be on test prep um, you want to think about when you want to take your first official exam. And I, I know, um, you know, Kim and I, our clients are, are different in this respect. Kim has some super high flyers that have been um, prepping this summer, and they're really eager and anxious to take the test in the fall, which is perfectly appropriate, particularly if they've had Algebra 2. Um, math and they've been able to get through that algebra two level math and and they want to take the test um it, early in the fall with the hopes of really being done and, and getting the score that they want and being you know kind of finished with that chapter of their their uh testing um i my clients um while i while i have very uh, ambitious clients um, my advice to the current clients that I have is that I uh, feel like they should, um, you know, obviously prep, 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 prep as much as they can, but I've encouraged the majority of my clients to wait out the fall uh, and to take their first official exam, um, you know, maybe November, December, even February of their, their junior year. I, uh, for my, for my particular juniors, um, it's not time sensitive. They don't feel a tremendous uh, rush or, or need to take it early in the fall. And if you don't feel that pressure, um, by all means, I would give priority to the seniors who are trying desperately to get their last um, test scores in before they have to apply. So my advice to the majority of my clients, and, and again, this is just going to vary a little bit from student to student and client to client, junior to junior, is um, to, to wait out the fall because it's going to be hectic and it's going to be nuts and um, so many seniors really need those test scores or want those test scores and the whole system's just kind of backlogged by now but um, right. focus on your test prep I absolutely advise uh, you know do not take your first official test until you are absolutely ready to do so until you are totally prepped and ready to roll don't use an official test to to practice right? Official test dates are not practice opportunities. Um, so that is uh, kind of the, the next thing I would think about. Uh, typically speaking, our juniors take the PSAT in the fall. Uh, generally, it's in mid-October. <laughs> Things remain to be uh, unsaid and untold for this fall. We don't know what's going to happen with the PSAT, um, but the PSAT, for those of you that may be unfamiliar, um, this is obviously uh, part of part of the SAT, a precursor to the SAT, and it's given to juniors in the fall. And um, the scores that juniors receive 
could potentially qualify them to become national merit semifinalists. Um, if you are identified as a national merit semifinalist, then you have the option um, and opportunity to apply to become a national merit finalist. And if you are named a national merit finalist um, for some colleges, there could be some sizable um, merit-based scholarships that go along with that uh, with that title. But I will say for um, really for all of the highly selective schools out there, um, there, there is, is really no merit-based scholarship that goes hand in hand with that title of being a national merit finalist. But um, the, yeah, so with that. Um, the other thing that I, I love for my juniors to be doing right now is visit, 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 and visit some more. And um, does the scope of visiting college campuses look different right now? Yep, absolutely. Uh, so as Kim mentioned, any opportunity that you can um, visit a college virtually, I highly recommend you doing so. And um, really the, the reason being is that once campuses do open up, and I, I do believe at some point in time, they're gonna open up, they're gonna open up those opportunities to visit uh, in person, you can make your visit process much more efficient. So I truly believe that with a virtual visit, you're probably going to be able to identify if this is one that you want to seriously consider and pursue further, that you want to visit in person or, or not, right? Um, the other important thing to keep in mind is that when you visit a campus, whether it's virtually, in person, or just by doing research, your visit feedback is what helps me as a, as a college counselor to help shape and mold your preliminary college list. And that's something that within your junior year, you'll want to do. You're going to want to um, develop uh, your preliminary college list, that list of colleges that you may ultimately end up applying to. And um, with all of that feedback that you can give me, that really is helpful uh, in helping to build that preliminary college list. So, so critical to identify your college budget. Um, I always use a housing analogy here, and that is that, um, you know, you would never think to go and, um, if you were house hunting, you would never think to go out and start looking at houses without understanding how much house can I afford? What do I want to spend on this house? Um, you know, if you know that you have a housing budget of $350,000, you're not going to go start looking at million dollar properties and um, very much the same premise when you're looking at colleges. College is expensive, right? So you have to know how much, how much can we invest in this process? How much are we willing to invest in this process? Um, you know, will that shape my end goal? Will it shape the types of schools that, you know, why do I need to look at schools where I know I'm going to get some kind of a merit-based aid or financial aid? How generous are the colleges that I'm, I'm considering in, you know, giving out merit-based aid or financial aid? So these are all, it's just so um, insanely uh, critical. Okay. Um, when I, when I mentioned or say identify your end goal, uh, I just want my juniors to start having conversations with, you know, your, your family, your friends, like, what, what are you, what are you aiming for, right? What's the most important thing to you when you're considering um, a college? Is the most important thing for you to get into the most highly selective school that you can get into? Uh, is the end goal to um, you know, get out of Illinois so you can be on the West Coast or the East Coast? Is the end goal to um, make sure that you're, a, uh, that you're going to a school where you can be a direct admin into a nursing program or a PT program or a business school um, or a specific type of engineering program? Uh, is your end goal to, to go to a college that's going to give you um, a sizable merit-based scholarship so that your undergraduate education is primarily uh, you know, funded, so maybe you can put your funds towards graduate school, you have to be thinking about what your end goal is and kind of work back from there because that absolutely affects the types of classes that you take or are taking. It affects, uh, you know, obviously, um, 
you gotta, you gotta do great in school, regardless of what that end goal is that can only help across all of those, um, those efforts, but it's just so important to be able to work towards something um, and being able to identify that relatively early on in the process. Um, I mentioned letters of recommendation here because it's highly likely that if the colleges that you're applying to require letters of recommendation from teachers, that they're gonna want those letters of recommendations to come from teachers that you've had your junior year. They're going to want to um, hear from teachers that have had your uh, student in a core class. So that would be an English, math, history, science, or a foreign language class. That's who they want to hear from. So, you know, you, you really want to start building some type of a rapport with the teachers that are, are teaching your core classes because it's highly likely that you're going to go back to, to one of those or two of those teachers and ask them to write a letter of recommendation on your behalf that will accompany all of your college applications next fall. And I think one of the things too on the letters of recommendation, and I've seen this written a few times, is because uh, learning is going to look different this year, it's going to be obviously more hybrid and online is it's going to be a little bit more challenging for you to get to know your teachers so you're going to have to make a little extra effort and if everything's on zoom maybe it's you reaching out to them on google classroom or through email or whatever your format is at your school but you want to make sure that you're developing that connection even if you're not in the building Oh, such a great point. Yes, Kim, ab absolutely. And, um, you know, this last kind of bullet point, a COVID-19 journal. And when I when I say this, I don't necessarily mean something super formal, you know, hard, hard book, you know, back book, whatever that you're jur physically journaling in, or I'm, I I'm talking about maybe a Word doc or a Google doc, something that you can um, document in a very general form, how you filled your time during the COVID-19 pandemic. What have you done with yourself? And it doesn't have to be anything grand. It doesn't have to be, I've been researching ways to cure cancer. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be anything spectacular, but it just has to be, um, I, I believe, and I mean, this is certainly true for our current seniors. They're, they have the option to address how COVID-19 has affected their lives, either negatively, positively, or if there's just something that they want to share about their um, the, their time during COVID-19, but I wouldn't be surprised at all if this year's juniors are also asked to comment or have the opportunity to comment on the ways the pandemic has affected them as well. And, uh, you know, this is, could be a, certainly you know, if there's a way that the COVID-19 has negatively impacted your family or, um, or, or oddly positively in, you know, impacted your, your family. Um, or, you know, I always kind of use examples like one of you know one of my clients um loves to bake and so what you know one thing that she's had the opportunity to do during COVID-19 is kind of fuss with some different recipes and try out some different recipes and she made these cookies and she made them a little differently and then she delivered them to you know some of her, her family members and and friends and that's a, a really cool thing that she was able to do during COVID-19 that with a little extra time that she may not have had time to do otherwise. Um, I have another client that's, you know, decided to be a pen pal for some um, residents in, in nursing homes because they're so isolated and so lonely. And that's something that she's chosen to do um, with her kind of extra time that she has. So just documenting and taking note of, of ways that you've been able to, um, you know, utilize your time, um, maybe some free time that you've had during COVID-19. Okay, and now for my sophomores, um, this isn't going to vary drastically from what I want my juniors to, to focus on, but... You want um, me to just click through all of them, Kendall, and... Fine. Yeah, and that'd be great. That's fine. Yep, yep, definitely. Um, so again, this focus on academics is never going to change, right? I mean, it's, it's just never going to vary. You're, you're, the transcript is undoubtedly one of the most important components that colleges are going to focus on. And that's pre-COVID-19, post-COVID-19, what are all COVID-19, um, the transcript's very important. So if you had a rough year, your freshman year, uh, make sure that you try to hit the ground running your, your sophomore year and kind of refocus, reshift um, that attention to your grades. Because uh, really, it's every, every, you know, every, every opportunity that you can prove yourself in the classroom is a, is a good one. So um, focus on academics. 
I, I think personally, and I, I answer this question all the time, Kim, I'm guessing you do too, but I have my very young clients. I noticed that we have a super young, um, someone that has a, a, a rising eighth grader, someone that's going to be an eighth grader. And they ask me, you know, can I start prepping? What, what can I do to start with test prep? The single best thing that you can do for your student, your child, young or old, is read, 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 and read some more. And I don't care if it's a magazine, a comic book, a novel, uh, a website, a, I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's fiction, nonfiction, sci-fi, romantic comedy, autobiography, whatever it is, find something that you're interested in and that will keep your attention and read, 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 and read some more, okay? Um, something to be on the lookout for for my sophomores is the, the PSAT 10. This is generally administered um, in the spring. It, it doesn't count for anything. So unlike the PSAT that is um, given to juniors in the fall of their junior year, and that's what's used to determine whether or not they are national merit semifinalist contenders, um, the PSAT is really just kind of a precursor and a practice for the PSAT that takes place for the juniors in the fall. Um, this year, my, my little sophomores this year that are now juniors, they didn't have the um, advantage of taking the, the PSAT in the spring because of uh, obviously schools were, were shut down. Um, but just know that hopefully um, by the time this spring rolls around, uh, we'll be able to, to sit for the PSAT. Um, I don't think it's necessary for you to prep for the PSAT that you'll take your sophomore year. Um, just use it, embrace it as an opportunity to practice um, the format of a standardized test. It's nothing to get stressed out about. It's nothing to get uptight about. It's nothing to study for or prep for. Just know that it's an opportunity to experience what a standardized test looks and feels like. Um, I love, 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 love. It's my one of my biggest pieces of advice for my younger clients get on a campus anytime you can. Start weaving college visits into your everyday travels, everyday life. Um, just you know, any opportunity that you have to be on a campus, large or small, urban or rural, hop on and visit that college campus. It can only help you to, to more narrowly um, define your, your college list as, as you get older. Um, and I love virtual visits. Uh, even even now for my younger clients. I'm working with a, a she's gonna be a sophomore, a rising sophomore now. And you know, we're already working on virtual visits. What did you like? What didn't you like? What would you like to see more of kind of questions? So um, this is very important. Demonstrated interest and what does that mean? You know, this looks a little different these days because um, really the the most traditional way of demonstrating interest on a for a college is um, to visit their campus, right? That's one way that a student can prove, hey, I'm really interested in your school, so interested in fact, I'm going to come on your college campus. I'm going to go on a student-led tour. I'm going to sit in on a general information session, um, and you'll know that I'm here and I. I made this extra effort, so you know that I'm really interested. It's very hard to do these days. So, um, ho however, I guarantee that um, there are many, many, many colleges that are uh, that are um, taking note of who has registered for a virtual tour, who has registered for a virtual general admission uh, information session, who has signed up to follow, uh, you know, their Twitter account, their Twitter feed, their Facebook page, um, who's input their email address on their admission site so that they can start um, receiving information and emails about a college campus. Um, when you get an email from a college that you're interested in, by all means, open it. Uh, you may wish to click on, you know, a couple embedded links. Um, many schools will take note of that. It's one way for them to be able to identify students that are, are um, very authentically interested in their school, okay? Last but not least, um, get involved. Uh, I always kind of tell my, my freshmen, my first year students that it's a time of exploration. It's a time to kind of explore a little bit, maybe be um, superficially involved in, in you know, five or six activities. By the time sophomore year rolls around, you wanna start honing in on those two or three extracurricular activities that really mean a lot to you and that um, potentially have some level of connectivity between you know, what you enjoy in high school and what you may wanna 
pursue at the college level. So there needs to be a little bit um, more focus within those extracurricular activities. I don't know, nor do you, what the scope of this looks like for this school year. Um, what extracurricular activities that you've been a part of, what, are, what is that gonna look like this year? Are there ways that um, you can still be involved through your high school or, or not? But time, time will tell. Um, and then Kim, I think this is, I think this is back to you. Yeah, so this is talking all about what to do and how you can creatively explore your interests. And some of it ties to the fact that we are probably going to be in a pandemic through, you know, the early part of next year. So first of all, you want to try, as Kendall just touched on, connecting your, your interests and to the different activities, whether it be through volunteer opportunities, different service work that you do, maybe creating a club at your school that is specific to those interests. So knowing that will, know, having that connectivity will strengthen an application. So that said, with COVID, a lot of the clubs this year are gonna be a little bit uncertain what's going to happen. So um, I, I encourage you, if you are somebody that's really involved and wants to, demonstrate your leadership and your 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 involvement for you enjoy it a and b you want to demonstrate it for future uh school applications to consider a you know can that be converted to an online opportunity or format so we just like to put that out there there's also um a lot of my clients and we gave this tip to them back when the pandemic first started, but did some amazing online courses over the course of the last four or five months, and I love it. So Coursera and edX are two mentioned here. LinkedIn has some, um, some of the actual universities have free classes. Yale was doing some, University of Michigan was another. So use, it's called creative, right? Because there's no right answer to this. Figure out how to be productive and engaged with your time. Schools are looking for uh, students that are gonna come to their campus and make an impact. And the, large, the best way for them to figure out what kind of impact you're gonna make is to understand what you did when you were on your high school campus and what happened in your community where you lived and what kind of impact you made. So some other examples, you know, taking a coding class, there's some great online research sites, particularly there was one, um, through the National Historical Museum in DC that was kind of cool. You have the opportunity to, you know, start a business, you know, have a, a hobby. There's some people that start nonprofits. So there's lots of great ideas. I think that the, because this could potentially impact, you know, sophomores and juniors is just figure out how to, you know, demonstrate who you are as a person and what you're about, what your core, you know, what your core interests are, what you're, you know, passionate about, and that'll translate through to your hobbies and in your activities that you, you know, pursue during this period. So don't use, oh, school was online and COVID existed. Guess what? Like, everyone else had that same issue. So figure out how to make that your, you know, how you took an obstacle and, you know, we're able to succeed. So um, I think that oop, it's not letting me. That's weird. Okay, there we go. All right. So these are kind of just general considerations for testing. I talked a little bit earlier about testing, um, test optional versus test blind. So if anyone came in late, test blind, the schools will never look at your test. Test optional, if you have strong scores, you want to submit them. Kendall made a great point, which is for the sophomores and juniors and freshmen, freshmen are not prepping for tests, but as you get into, you know, the age where you're considering prepping, this school that's test optional for the class of 2021 may not be test optional for you, so keep that in mind. Oh, sorry. Okay. All right, so for those that are fairly new to the whole testing scene, all of the colleges and universities will take either the ACT or the SAT. Those are the two standardized tests. SAT, the state of Illinois, um, SAT won the contract with the state of Illinois about three years ago. And so as Kendall mentioned, that uh, test starts so the, typically there's a PSAT 9 freshman year, a 10 PSAT 10 sophomore year, 
PSAT 11 is the national merit one. And then the SAT uh, will be in April, it, assuming the pandemic allows, of your junior year. And that is the official test if you're in a public school. That does not mean if you're a junior that you have to wait until April to take that test. As Kendall mentioned, depending on your rigor of your curriculum and your, your different situation, you may be taking that test anywhere from you know, summer before junior year all the way through this April date. Um, the risk of taking your first official test at the school sitting in April is that if things don't go as planned, that you then have a, a more limited window to be able to get to your goal score. So keep that in mind as you're doing your planning that um, you know the tests are offered almost every month at this point. It, but you know a lot of the rising seniors that don't have the test scores they want were some that were waiting to take their first test in April and you know, not that we're expecting another pandemic is going to hit, but there's, you never know what's going to happen. You might get ill, you might have, you know, something come up with your family, you, whatever. There's many reasons why you don't want to wait until the last minute. So just know if you're on an accelerated curriculum, um, the state of Illinois is targeting April of junior year because that is when the entire state they feel the, the majority of the students will be ready. If you're on an accelerated curriculum, you might be ready earlier than that. Um, so I already kind of talked about the test plan and strategy. The um, opportunity, so with all of our clients, we offer a diagnostic ACT and SAT test, which is fabulous. It allows the students to see which test they prefer. And then um, it helps also for figuring out sort of a rough, in rough terms, a potential school list, right? So some students might have a perfect ACT uh, score is 36, perfect SAT score is 1600. Some students are looking and targeting those scores and that would be one set of schools. Other students would be perfectly happy and thrilled to get a 30 ACT or a 28 ACT or a 26, and that would be a different set of schools. So. I just wanted to, and I know we're really late, so I'm gonna go through just the importance of it. The free resources are on here. I think Nicole's gonna send you guys this um, slide deck after, so I'll just go through. The other thing I just wanted to mention is ACT was originally uh, this fall gonna roll out an online test format and then some partial retakes for certain sections, and that's not happening till next fall. So if you're a sophomore or junior, you might want to um, just be on the lookout for the notifications on that. Get on with the uh, Twitter feed with uh, ACT. SAT is managed by College Board, just to know what that's happening. And then, um, yeah, they did AP testing that way. So I think the next couple of slides are just about testing and test dates. ACT added some additional dates. So you guys can get all of these at ACT.org. But if you are a rising senior or junior, um, just knowing what's out there. These are ACT, they've added Sunday dates. They're really trying to help everybody get caught up that was behind. And same with SAT, they added some dates. So you can get through all those. And I think that is it, that is for us. This is all about just spotlight is the last slide about what we do. So we do you know, college consulting for families that really are just looking for additional help. We work with students. Um, that are looking for a broad range of schools and they might need help with everything from assessments, college and major assessments to figure out a career path. They might need help assessing which schools would be the best fit, which schools would offer the best merit scholarships, all those types of things. So that's it. So that's us and thank you for listening. I think that now we're gonna just do question and answer. Um, there was one, um, one question in particular that popped up and I apologize, I can't see the time, so I don't, I don't know what we're, we, um, time. But anyway, uh, one in particular that said, um, was interested in knowing, we have a rising senior and I'm interested in, in a handful of different schools, but wants to know, you know, should my student apply to more schools than, uh, than I was planning on, um, kind of in this year of unknown, this, um, and I, my, my immediate, 
answer to this, even though I, I told you earlier, please don't apply to any schools that you have no intention of going to. Uh, but honestly, my immediate um, kind of response to this question is, is yes. I, I personally would um, advise casting the net maybe a, a little wider, particularly for, uh, you know, we have, we have some highly selective schools in, in the list um, for this particular um, attendee. And in, in my opinion, it would be, be wise uh, to, to, to maybe add a, a couple more schools in, into the mix that uh, you know your, your student would be interested in going to if accepted. So, Kim, I don't know if you have a different take on that, but that would no, be my I think that's a, I think that was an excellent answer. Cool. We also had another question that was about SAT subject tests that was submitted in advance. Um, many universities say it's helpful to take them and submit the scores, but they're wondering now, since time has passed, since they completed the class, if that's still important to take the test. And I guess I would say it depends on the selectivity and level of schools that you're considering applying to. Um, SAT subject tests, for those that don't know, are required by, not recommended typically and required in pre-COVID by many of the more selective schools. They have a top score of 800, but they are very competitive. So if you're applying to MIT and you're, they're giving you this request for two subject test scores, you basically have to get you know, close to 800. So for perspective uh, on the math too, I think 780, which out of 800 seems really good, right? Is actually the 78th percentile already. So for the person that submitted this, I would advise that it's not too late to take subject tests. If your student had the classes this year, they are offered, um, every subject test is not offered at every SAT sitting but they are offered, you know, you can go on College Board's website and you'll see which dates which are offered. You cannot take them on the same day you take the SAT, but you are able to take up to three subject tests and one sitting at one date. So if you have three classes, you can prep in advance. There's some great resources online and there's some great books on Amazon, Barnes Noble. Just do some prep, review your class notes because for those to be meaningful for those more selective schools that are interested in those subject tests, you are gonna to wanna to score high. Anything, Kendall, else on the subject tests that I didn't mention? No, no, that was that was perfect. That was perfect, Kim. Um, I have one more question that just rolled in. It said, if your child's interests are primarily in sports and they're unable to play this fall, do you have a suggestion for how they should address that? And um, I'm, I'm working with a, a student that has um, high, high hopes of playing basketball at the collegiate level. Um, her aspirations are to play at the D1 level. And, um, you know, she mercifully is still able to train with her travel team. And, uh, you know, the showcases and the tournaments that they're going to look a little different. But if your student um, or student athlete does not have the opportunity to actually play, uh, like my, my client does, then, um, of course, you know, training takes on on a whole nother uh, element in a whole nother um, really realm. Um, it would be interesting, I'd be interested to know what, what age your, your student um, is, if you wanna type that in, because that definitely plays a part. My particular client is um, a little younger. She's just gonna be a sophomore, so she's gonna have a little bit more time to reco recover, if you will, from, from COVID. He's a rising junior, so that's good. Um, you really, uh, if he is, um, if he's currently being recruited, that's one thing you're going to want to maintain contact with whomever he's currently talking to. If he's on a travel league or team, he wants to be able to identify with his coach that he wants to play at the college level. And that travel coach should have some advice and expertise for how to, um, for how to, to kind of uh, move forward. Um, I've had a lot of Client, I'm not a, not a lot. I'm not working with a ton of student athletes at the moment, but I have in years past. And they um, documentation of your skill level is really important. Uh, there are athletic resumes that you can create. Um, I'm working with with my client currently to um, create a skills resume and um, kind of a target list of, of 
of coaches that they want to contact. I also think that research is a really, really important and critical element in any student athlete. If you've identified a college or colleges that you are interested in playing for or he's interested in playing for, what are the statistics for that for the athletes that are currently competitive there? Um, and how do, how do his statistics line up with those that are currently playing or getting airtime uh, or playing time at those colleges? So. Um, I apologize for the vagueness. It's a little hard to address if I don't know the specifics of the, you know, the sport, the, and, and so on, but. I was going to say the other thing time. too, because I'm working with a swimmer and a golfer right now. The other thing that uh, we've been working on and talking about is just recording like workout, like what yes. you're doing to stay in shape, workout videos. They want to know if you can't, like Kendall's client is lucky because in the mm -hmm. golfing season is and swimming is somewhat like that where I think they're still able to do a little bit, but both of them are also doing some recording of their workout sessions to be able to demonstrate that they're passionate about it and they're staying fit uh, above and beyond sort of the video clips that their family's able to take of them while they're actually participating in their sport. So if you, I assume like you are probably already doing some of the video recording, if they're able to, you know, participate in some, at some level that I would just continue on and do, you know, from a, a journaling standpoint, as well as a video standpoint, just to demonstrate, because guess what, a year from now, when you might be applying for school, you might not remember all those details. So I've been encouraging my clients to sort of work on tracking that and recording as much as possible. Okay. One of them is thinking of you and setting up her um, own little YouTube channel, which would be fun okay. and funny to share the link. So okay. just again be creative it's covid in some of the sports are not as lucky they're not gonna some of the like football may not happen at all for a lot of these high schools i think tomorrow actually is when the illinois high school sports association announces if there's going to be fall sports season mm -hmm. so um i know at our high school everyone's on it pins and needles a bit so it's just going to be for some of these athletes do or die and so if you're an athlete whose sport is canceled i would encourage you to then kind of revert to past building a reel of your past yep. clips yep. and documenting your workout regimen and being in touch obviously with um, the schools you're interested in to find out what their workout routines are and what they recommend and building kind of like Kendall and I both talked about in other parts of this presentation, but just building your connectivity yep. with those coaches because yep. obviously, you know, the recruiting element, uh, them knowing who you are and knowing where you fall in their That's schematic is really important. Huge. And the other thing for athletes is many of the schools have um, a team, they have to maintain a team average, right? So let's yeah. say you're a, a rock star academically and a really good golfer. They might be interested in you at certain schools because you're going to help the team as well as keep the team's GPA higher, right? So just know that each school sort of has their own um, method of figuring yeah. out and balancing that. But I think sometimes the, the really, really strong student can be a really good athlete and be super appealing for that the, the, a team average reason. Yeah. I, had a, I had a senior, um, I had a senior who's interested in playing soccer that uh, in addition to the skills tape or YouTube video is actually what she did that she submitted to our coaches. She did something like just told like, this is me during COVID-19 doing other stuff, right? Riding my bike, you know, hanging out. Oh, with yeah. with her. And it was just a really, really cute taste of her personality and, and ways that she was, uh, you know, if she wasn't playing soccer and she wasn't studying here, a couple of things that I I'm, I'm doing to fill my time. And I, I love that idea uh, of just kind of giving coaches another insight on, you know, who she, who she was and what she was going to bring to the table as a teammate, as a student, as a member of that student body. I thought it was a cool idea. So that's cute. I like that. Yeah. Anything, other questions? Uh, not that I can see. I hope I'm not missing anyone, but I don't think I am. I think um, from the chat and from the yep. Q&A. I don't see any, don't see any new ones. Okay, good. So I think we're at time. Thank anyway. you. Yeah, we are. All right. Thank you Thanks everyone so for uh, attending tonight and I hope this was informative. Awesome. Thanks.